Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar hosted by the Music Industries Association. My name is Steve Greenall. I am the CEO of Warwick Music Group and Musical Instruments Manufacturer, and I also have the privilege of being the board chair of the Music Industries Association. Uh, we represent music retailers and suppliers uh, from small uh, SMEs right the way through to global corporations, and we're delighted to have you with us this afternoon. Um, in our recent survey of the industry in the UK, we uncovered the fact that over 85%, that's 85% of our members are exporters. And given that 50% of our members are retailers, a huge amount of retail is exporting, as well as our supplier members as well. Um, so we've got a fascinating uh, lineup today, uh, some new, new news coming out of DIT and UK Export Finance, which I know you'll be excited to learn about, and more support for businesses, which we're uh, very delighted to support as well. Um, before we do that, uh, we are required to share our compliance statement for competition law. Um, obviously, this is a statement which is just telling us that um, we want to follow the rules um, of UK competition law in, in relation to the Competition Act of 1998, and we aren't going to be discussing or sharing anything that's sensitive or not in the public domain this afternoon. Thank you very much, Alice. So we have two expert speakers with us this afternoon. Um, the first um, who's going to be talking first is Pete Chapman. Uh, he's an international trade advisor uh, and music specialist at the Department for International Trade. And he also has a background in the music industry. You can see from his uh, beautiful um, collection uh, on the wall behind him, uh, that he's, a, he's a bit of a museum himself. So it's delighted to have Pete with us. And after Pete speaks, um, we're going to introduce Jane Cooper. Now, Jane Cooper works for UK Export Finance, who sit alongside DIT as a credit agency, supporting uh, businesses and their ability to have finance to support their exports. And Jane is a former trumpet player and also has a household of children who are active musicians as well. So welcome to Jane, and we look forward to hearing from you shortly. And um, at this point, I'd like to hand over proceedings to Pete, who's going to tell us all about what's going on at DIT. Okay, thank you, Stephen, and uh, thanks for the introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's good. A bit, a bit louder would be good, Pete. A bit louder would be good. Uh, okay, let me just see if I can um, share my screen. Just bear with me. Okay, can you see my screen? Um, All good. Looks good. All right, just two seconds. This worked perfectly in. Okay, here we go. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Pete Chapman. Uh, as Stephen said, I'm an international trade advisor, or ITA for short, uh, for DIT. So I've just got a few slides to go with you today, just for a general overview. Um, so first off, just a little bit about DIT. I'm sure many of you know about us uh, and uh, working with DIT, or maybe have done in the past. Um, but uh, the Department of International, Tr International Trade is the government department to support uh, international trade. Um, in, in London at HQ, we have trade policy and trade relation teams. Um, obviously, very high profile at the moment. They are working on free trade agreements uh, with many countries. Very high profile one is Japan. Uh, which has been announced recently um, and they're also rolling over lots of the agreements that we had via the EU and our independent deals now with the UK. So all that is uh, going on at a high level uh, in London. We also have sector teams based in London uh, and we also have UKEF as Stephen mentioned and Jane will talk about UKEF a little bit later. Um, we also have overseas teams based at the, the embassies and the consulates and high commissions, and I'll mention that a little bit later. Um, and locally, uh, across the English regions, we have um, regional teams of international trade advisors and other specialist advisors to, to, to help you. Um, you might have seen uh, the, the, the great campaign. So if I just quickly go back to uh, the music is great, and I think that particular uh, image is, is very striking. So um, that that's, uh, music is great or exporting is great or whatever is great is a very powerful image, I think. 
Um, so a little bit about myself, um, so, so International Trade Advisor um, based in the West Midlands in Staffordshire. I've been doing this role for about nine years now. Uh, I am a generalist ITA, which means I, I work across multi-sectors of, uh, of companies of all sizes. And I do have a bit of a focus on creative and tech. And saying that, I've got a very wide range of companies that I work with, which is, which is fantastic. Uh, in a previous life, I was a commercial officer for uh, DIT, UKTI at the time, that was based in Japan. And you can see the embassy down there, bottom left. Uh, it was a fantastic time. Um, a, a brief stint working at Universal Music Japan. Um, I also work in artist management. Uh, and I worked for HMV for, for 25 years, um, starting off in Birmingham when I was 16, and was very fortunate enough that that took me all the way to Tokyo, where I helped develop the business um, over there. So that's a little bit about myself. Um, right, I wanted to mention greats.gov.uk. Um, this is the main website that I'm sure you've seen. If you haven't or you've not looked at it for a while, this is, this is really your starting place. So there's a couple of, uh, of, of uh, screenshots there. Um, and there's the link that you can go to later. Um, on here, you can, you can create a business profile, which can be seen by uh, overseas buyers and our teams overseas. And it takes just a few minutes to do that. It's very straightforward. You can also register to find export opportunities and you can do that um, kind of via your particular sector or by a country. You can set it how you want to do it and they can come once a day or once a week. So I'd urge you to have a look at that. If you're not working with someone like myself, then that's the link to go to. And you can see that bottom right. Just type in you know, your postcode and it'll come up with a team that looks after you in, in your area. You can then either give them a call or just fill out a very simple um, form and then somebody will give you a call to arrange a meeting with an ITA. So again, maybe you've worked with one in the past, but for whatever reason that relationship collapsed. Uh, but that's the best way to find an ITA in your region if you're not already working with one. There's also a lot of information on there about online marketplaces. Um, we have digital uh, trade advisors that work with us and I know we have those uh, in all the different regions across the English regions. Um, and there's a lot of support to, to help retailers uh, sell on various online marketplaces internationally. And some of them can be quite specific for different types of products and sectors. So maybe have a look at that. And there's a whole host of information, support and advice on great.gov.uk. So if you do nothing else after today's webinar, I'd urge you just to have a quick look at that and have a look around and uh, that, that's your starting point. Um, right, just, just talk about local and, and regionally. Um, the, there are nine English regions and we, we all work slightly differently. So as I say, I'm part of the West Midlands team. Uh, and in the West Midlands, we, we break down even further. So I just work in Staffordshire. Um, so from that point of view, we're all generalists. We, we work with uh, companies of all different sectors, uh, shapes and sizes. In other regions, they work slightly differently. I know in the East Midlands, they tend to, to, to have more specialists that cover a wider area uh, and the regional structure is slightly different. In the West Midlands, we're aligned. We, we actually work for chains of commerce, so we have great contacts with them. Uh, in other regions, uh, they're not connected to the chambers. So it might be slightly different depending on where you are in the country, um, but th the support is still going to be there for you. Um, whatever the case, I would say that your first point of contact is going to be uh, your, your, your ITA. Um, so we are the people that, that can be your general point of contact and then we can bring in the various different people and specialists um, as the journey develops. Um, a few things to, I wanted to mention the Export Academy. Um, this is something that's relatively new. It's not in all regions. At the moment it's been trialled in the Midlands Engine, the Northern Powerhouse and the Southwest region. Um, it's a pilot, it could be uh, extended, I'm not quite sure. But basically, this is uh, a new program that's been developed to help companies that are new to export, um, mainly companies that are below 500k turnover. 
uh, and maybe a reactive exporters or would like to start uh, but haven't done so far or want to be a bit more proactive. Um, so the Export Academy, and that is a clickable link. Um, there's a whole series of uh, webinars, roundtables, mentoring sessions um, to help you get started. Um, and even if you have exported a bit in the past, but you maybe want to start again as a fresh, um, that this could be a good place for you. So I say not in all regions at the moment, but uh, that link when you get the slides afterwards uh, can give you a little bit more information about that. Um, as well as UITA, the, there are various local specialists, uh, and again, it might differ depending on where you are. Uh, we have a fantastic digital trade advisor in our patch, a lady called Teresa, um, and she can work with you to give you advice and support on your digital international strategy. And it could be something as basic as, you know, the, you know, is your website um, mobile friendly? So it can be seen by Google, is it loading quick enough? There's some of the basics, but it could be a case of, you know, international um, uh, translations on your website or your social media presence. Anything that is important to you, uh, we can arrange for uh, a virtual one-to-one -one where she can do a little bit of uh, prep work on your website. And then depending on what you're interested in, she can spend some time with you to, to support you through that journey. International marketplaces, as I mentioned earlier as well, she can help you with that. Uh, free of charge, and she's not trying to sell you anything at the end of it. So that's a, a great resource. And the feedback we get is, is always very positive. And I do know that we have uh, Theresa colleagues all across the English regions. Uh, we have a language and culture specialist, Gertie. Um, she runs various events throughout the years, uh, focusing on certain markets. Um, and she's always happy to talk to companies if they have any particular questions or maybe planning to go to, to a, a market they're not familiar with. Um, and we also have a guy called Harry uh, that looks after what we call routes to market. So that could be, um, you know, working with agents or working with distributors, or if you need some a chat about international IP, um, intellectual property, we, we can draw on his extra level of expertise to help in those areas. So again, depending on where you are, there the, the will be certain kind of local uh, regional specialists that the ICA can bring in uh, to help companies uh, with their international strategy. Um, some, of the, some of the activity we get up to, obviously COVID has, has, has stopped some of this at the moment, but um, trade shows, um, trade missions, meet the buyer events, workshops, other sorts of events, all that type of thing. Again, a lot of it you, you, you might know and have participated in in the past. Um, those are the, typically the kind of things that we get involved in. Uh, and hopefully, touch wood, as we start to come out of COVID, a lot of that activity will come um, from being virtual to, to, to being physical again, and we can people can start flying and um, and meeting people overseas again. But typically, those are some of the the uh, the, the activities that we get up to. Um, I wanted to mention Export Champions briefly, and uh, that's the, the logo down there. So this is something again that's relatively new. Um, we introduce export champions, and this is where we work with individuals from companies that uh, DIT have worked with for a while. Uh, I've been through the journey, um, I've got the experience, of, uh, I've got the scars of, of, of doing it, um, and we can use these export champions to, to talk to other companies that are maybe a little bit newer to exporting, because sometimes it's great to hear from another company that have been there and done it and are doing it rather than, you know, hearing from people like myself. Um, Stephen is, is one of our export champions, so I've worked with Stephen at Work Music for um, two or three years now um, and um, worked quite well together uh, and Stephen agreed to be an export champion um, and you know delivers this type of thing for us sometimes and also goes to various, various kind of high profile um, events. Um, so hopefully he finds it useful and it's great to have people like Stephen to present to, to, to some of our other companies that are newer to exports. Yeah, I think Pete, just on that point particularly, especially especially for the seasoned exporters, 
um, amongst the MI community, and there are many of those. Um, I think this is definitely a, a scheme that's really interesting. In fact, we, we just had the Export Champions newsletter this morning. Some of the other things is being involved with some of the free trade talk arrangements uh, last year on roundtable events and, and yeah. networking with other export champions. Uh, it's really it's always useful to get tips from people outside of your industry as well as your own. And, and just, yeah. I, I, just to be clear, for those who are newer to, to exporting, Pete, all of these services that you're providing, what, what's the cost for all that, Pete? What, how much is it going to cost our members to have access to this DIT uh, uh, advisor? Everything up to this point, there's no no cost at all. So, so, so working with an IT, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, working with an ITA, uh, the specialist that I've mentioned, um, the, the, there's no cost to that. Obviously, if there's a trade mission, um, then obviously that will incur some costs. Sometimes there's a participation fee and, and obviously your flights and things like that. But in terms of the support, no, there's no cost to it. I will come on in a minute to, to some of the international overseas support and some of that can incur a cost, which I'll explain. Um, but we're really here to encourage uh, and support companies either to start exporting uh, or, or to, to do more of it. And at the end of the day, um, you know, what I'm targeted on is working with companies that are exporting more. Um, so no, there's, there's no cost at this point at all. Fantastic. Great. Um, on Export Champions, I think we've got 400 now across the English regions and I think about uh, 70 in, in the Midlands. So that's that, that's fantastic. And I know um, we're looking to expand that uh, going forward into 2021 as well. Um, the ESIF International Grants, which I'm sure is, is going to be uh, of interest. Uh, ESIF stands for a European uh, structural and investment fund it's a european grant uh, i'm going to come back to that a little bit later so i'm just going to pin that for, for now um i just wanted to mention uh local partners so as i say we work out of the chambers of commerce in the west midlands so we're closely aligned to them so that's fantastic when it comes to companies that have issues with their documentation or logistics because we, we, we pretty much work with the documentation teams um but also that the local growth hub, Staffordshire Growth Hub is fantastic. And I know that, that, that they work for reps and um, they're, they're up and down the, the country. And the growth hub is really the kind of the umbrella organization for business support. So, and there's loads of cross referrals happen these days. So I could be working with a company like Stephen, we could be talking about international. As we get to know each other, he might just say that he oh, I don't know, might need to, to, to find some help, advice on hiring apprenticeships um uh or uh, you know, working with universities or getting a, a, a capital grant for a piece of equipment which isn't my bag but i can refer you to the growth hub they'd be happy to talk to you and then kind of advise you on the best person to speak to um so there's a lot of support out there so um you know i would urge you that you know again obviously for anything international it's us but I, i'd really mention your, your chambers of commerce and, and growth hubs uh, etc in terms of, of local support. Um, right, I'm going to move on to the next slide, which is a little bit about kind of national and um, overseas support. Um, so sector teams, I mentioned this at the start. So we have sector teams that, that cover most of the, the, the key sectors and they work on kind of CIS, uh, uh, key events and trade shows and trade missions uh, and events. Um, I work quite closely with the creative guys in, in London um, and uh, th th work on lots of kind of creative, whether it's creative content and I've got a team that works on the experience economy, it's, it's obviously a very, very big sector. Um, so we do have kind of specialists and, and teams there, so we, we've got that you know, additional level of support. Um, we work closely with partners, so obviously the trade associations and obviously today uh, with the MIA, so close relationship with the trade associations across all the different sectors. Um, I quickly wanted to mention TAP grants. Some of you may have, um, have, have had these in the past. TAP stands for Trade Access Programme, um, and that's where DIT work with all the different trade associations, agree what the key international trade shows are. So for you guys, it's going to be things like, uh, like NAMP, for example. Um, and then uh, DIT would give the trade association a pot of money 
uh, and they would put on a, a UK pavilion at these trade shows. And then there can be tap grants available for companies to help towards the cost of exhibiting at these trade shows. Um, so uh, yeah, fantastic, it might not cover the whole cost, but it can make the difference if you may be doing one of these shows or not. Um, and I think, you know, for getting out to trade shows is so important. Um, at the moment, obviously they're not happening, um, but I do know that the TAP team uh, are piloting a uh, kind of like a virtual TAP grant up until the end of March. So obviously only a few weeks to go. They're gonna see how that goes and review it. Uh, and again, I suppose, depending on how quickly we come out of COVID and shows start happening again, that may get extended. I'm not quite sure if I'm honest with you. Uh, and I think the whole TAP scheme is, is being looked at as well, but, but hopefully we'll get back to some kind of normality later in the year. Trade shows will start to happen again. Um, what I would say to you is if you're interested in these and you've got a trade show that you know you'd like to go to, you think is right for you, is either talk to your ITA or talk to the MIA, you know, talk to Stephen, talk to Alice, uh, and they can tell you which trade shows are available for grants and talk you through that process. Um, but uh, they are a fantastic way to, to, to help you get to these trade shows. Um, the ESIF grant, I've got that on there again, sounds like I'm teasing you, but I'm going to come back to that at the end because I've got a separate slide. Uh, so just moving on to, to overseas, um, we've got DIT teams based at uh, British embassies and conscience and high commissions all over the world. As I mentioned, I, I worked uh, when I worked for, for the IT, I was based at the embassy in Tokyo. Um, and they're made up of, uh, of diplomats, UK diplomats, uh, and also locally engaged staff. Um, and also we have a network of overseas partners. Um, so it depends on the market. So uh, some countries it's very much still DIT delivery in terms of the support in markets. For other countries, it can be a mixture of DIT and a DIT designated overseas partner. Um, and that, you know, sometimes that depends on the sector. And again, your ITA will be able to explain that to you. But there is a lot of support on the ground for UK companies once you've identified a market that is of interest to you. Um, and I just wanted to mention uh, a new service, which we call ICE, which is Enhanced International Support Service, I think. <laughs> um, at the moment, that's we've got that set up for the US and for China, obviously both huge markets. And I think in the past, there was just so many ad hoc inquiries, it was, it was kind of difficult to manage. So. The way this works now is um, it used to be that the uh, the company would fill in a survey monkey type portal. Um, so you put in your, your basic kind of details, who you are, what you do, and then what support you're looking for in that market. The ITA does that now. So this would all come about for you having a discussion with your ITA. The ITA would get to know you, find out what support you're looking for, in this case, the US or China would complete this on your behalf, it would get sent off, and then within a couple of days, you'll get a response. And depending on uh, the nature of the inquiry, the size of your business, uh, the sector, it will either be DIT or it could be the overseas partner. So in the US, it's um, an organization called OCO Global. Uh, and in China, it's, uh, it's Grant Thornton. Um, um, and they will just contact you. And if you've asked for a little bit of kind of like specific information, they might be able to just send that to you on an email. But generally it's a case of, uh, we've got your inquiry, let's, you know, let's arrange a conference call just to find out, you know, what you need and we can talk that through in a little bit more, a little bit more detail. Now that could be, if it's just off the shelf advice and support, uh, you know, maybe a list of, lawyers or, or accountants in that market then you know they might have that off the shelf and can just send that to you and of course there's no charge for anything like that but sometimes it could be a, a case of uh, you're looking to find a partner uh, in the country in the us so you know maybe you're looking to find some customers or looking to find an agent or maybe you're looking to do some kind of launch events and, and, and use you know the embassy or the, the, the one of the consulates to do that so anything when it comes to kind of bespoke work where you ask the, the, the team to do some work on your behalf, that's where a fee will come in. 
um, they'll talk to you about that and you know obviously they'll make sure they uh, understand what you're looking for and then they'll, they'll, they'll talk that through and they'll say yeah we can do that for you we can go out and you know warm up some some clients for you or, or try to find you an agent um, but that will take a sex amount of hours and it's going to cost you x amount of money you can then decide whether you want to go ahead with that or not Pete. Um, just on that on that ice uh, relationship she's been talking about there, Danielle's asked, and she's saying she's just launched in China with support from DIT, but she hasn't yeah. heard of ice. So how does she get help? Is that done through her ITA, or is there a website specifically she needs to go to? Uh, I would say definitely go through your ITA. Um, I, I had a company recently for, for China, and I must admit, when I I thought it was a case of the company would have to fill in this portal the initial inquiry but now is very much they, they want the ita to do that so the ita um, is the international trade advisor so one of your colleagues in the yeah. region go yeah. and, so register on the website if you haven't got an ita uh, yeah. which is the one you shared at the start and if you do have an ita speak to them about ice and yeah. and, and they'll should be able to help you great thanks yeah I, yeah I, I think obviously as you build the relationship like we did Stephen, you know you start to talk about opportunities and priorities and if US and China is one of those, then we do have support on the ground there. Um, and the best way for, for both myself as the trade advisor and the company to facilitate that in initial introduction is via this ICE service. It is very new and I'm guessing it's going to be tweaked over time. Uh, but yes, I, I would say, you know, via the ITA, do that initial inquiry and that will lead to, 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 to a call and it will just there. Great. I've also made a note, we've also got the EU Trade Hub, which isn't like an official ICE scheme, but we've got a similar thing in the EU for most EU countries. So, um, you know, if you're looking at the EU, which I'm sure a lot of you are, um, we've got a similar service there where we, we can fill in like an initial questionnaire. And then uh, I think the team is based in the Czech Republic and they, they, they can then come back to you. Uh, and then if you may be looking at various different European markets, they can facilitate the various introductions to, to the relevant people in your sector. So that's some of the overseas support. Um, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about kind of my current focus on what I'm working on as an ITA, an International Trade Advisor. It's obviously been a horrible year. You don't need me to tell you that. Um, so, I mean, we've been just doing whatever we can to help the businesses that I work with on a regular basis through, through COVID and, and through some of the post-transition challenges. So it's been tough, but working as hard as we can to, 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 to help companies through difficult times. I am starting now to see that companies are now starting to plan ahead a little bit more and, and kind of like starting to, to focus on their plans for 2021 and when things open up again, going to trade shows. So, it's nice that uh, I'm starting to have those kind of looking ahead discussions, which is great. Um, post transition and Brexit, I, I'm not going to focus too much on this because you're probably fed up of it and, and been on lots of other webinars. But um, obviously, there's, there's, there are challenges there, you know, when it comes to rules of origin, VAT, shipping, you know, just trying to get a, a freight forwarder to move your stock. There's big challenges there. So, um, you know, we, we, we're not, you know, I'm not a VAT expert, I'm not a customs expert, but we do obviously work with these areas a lot. So we kind of help you with some of that stuff. Um, we can just help chat it through. And then obviously we can point you in the right direction and signpost you to, you know, to the relevant uh, government departments, or, you know, if we've seen a really good webinar that could be of use to you on, you know, VAT or some of the changes coming in for e-commerce from July, that type of thing. So we've got a good wealth of knowledge there. So we're, we're happy to help you in those areas. I, th I think just just on that point as well, Pete. I know that the MIA uh, Alice has been sharing. Uh, to, to your point, DIT is actually not responsible for the the movement of goods over the border. I know that sits within HM, HMRC's purview. And I know uh, Alice has been sharing. There was an excellent webinar that Mazars did last week, which is on the MIA website, talking about helping companies move products across border. Uh, export tariffs, you know, country of origin issues, all of that. Uh, there's HMRC webinars as well, which I think you've just recently shared. So um, there's lots of stuff around that. 
uh, which is available on the MIA website, or email Alice or reach out to Alice and she'll be able to direct you to the best resource. And I know the ITAs like yourself have also been trying to help as well where you can uh, with the knowledge that you've got, uh, although appreciate you're not sector specialists in export customs declaration forms. So yeah. um, just a couple of questions that are coming in, if it's, it's, if it's okay. Um, yeah. Luke um, from Bibico, hi Luke, great to, great to hit, uh, have you here, thank you. He was asking about um, the future of TAP grants. Uh, do you have any more insight into um, what's the situation with TAP grants going forward? Uh, to be honest, I don't. I, all I, I, I do know that obviously, as I mentioned, that the virtual TAP grants is being piloted. Um, and then obviously that will be reviewed with DIT and the, the Treasury um, to, to see if that can be continued and obviously a lot of that will be depending on how long they see the COVID situation going on. Um, and then in terms of, of, of going back to the normal kind of TAP grants, um, it's regularly reviewed, um, but I, I don't really have any more information, Stephen, at this point to, to give you on that. All I would say is, is just, uh, you know, as you start to earmark trade shows for, for later this year and maybe going into 2022, because quite often they're and you know that could be once every two years or whatever um it's, it's just talk to your ita and talk in this case talk to yourselves at the mia i know um, yeah that's great Pete. i know i know uh, luke also that the mia is part of a uk export partners group which is a, a collection of the trade associations that are that manage tap grant programs for dit and i i spoke to one of the senior leaders there and i i think we're all waiting for the review uh, that DIT is doing of the virtual tap grants to, to be completed this this um, in the next few months, and we hope to hear some news about that later on. But I also I, I'm, I'm eager for, for us to get onto the news that may well um, you know benefit our members even if they can't access a top grant. So I don't know if that's the the next slide is upon us yet, Pete, or the the reveal is is coming. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. Um... So, so yeah, so just finish this off slide very quickly. So obviously now it's starting to work on, as I say, planning ahead. So, um, you know, where possible, we, we, we're here to help companies that have immediate issues and, and challenges and questions. But then it's nice when we can start to, 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 to do a little bit more strategically. So we can start to do a diagnostic on a company to get to know them better, start to work on an action plan uh, that can then lead into, uh, once we've identified, uh, a series of activities that the company is looking to do. Um, if we can then help with, you know, whether it's a case of an introduction to colleagues overseas, or if it's a trade show you wanted to go to, or an independent market visit, or you wanted to get your website translated, if we can help align that with the grants, then uh, obviously we're, we're happy to do that as well. So I'm starting to do more of that work now as well, which is nice. The, the next slide is, I've just done a few links on here on, on Brexit tra transition. I'm not going to go through these and, and Stephen said, you know, we're, uh, we, we, we are a government department and, and there's so many different government departments that are there to help you with this. But if you're still completely new to this, then uh, have a look at this slide. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a very fluid situation. So and if this is recorded and you're looking at this in a few weeks time, some of these could well be out of date. But you know, look at the Brexit checker. There's lots of information there, um, you know, videos and webinars. Um, so, you know, if you want to look at a few links afterwards, then, you know, these, these, these should help you. And Alice will be sending out the slides and we'll be posting about uh, a recording of this, uh, this uh, webinar as well, which will have the slides associated with them as well. So you've got all the direct links will be in the presentation. Okay. Um, okay, and, and my last slide is this new, uh, internationalization fund um, which I've been teasing you with so here we go it's um, just a few points on here and I'm going to stress at the start and at the end that the, the key thing on here is to have a conversation with your international trade advisor but, but just to give you a flavor it's a European grant so you, it's similar to the United grants you might have heard of in the past or had in the past but they've tended to be regional in the past, but now this is very much a English region, um, kind of like nationwide program. Um, it's administered by Capita, um, and there's matched grants available between one and nine thousand pounds. 
for activity um, and this is going to be open for a couple of years uh, and it's obviously subject to eligibility and availability um, but it's very new I mean it, it's literally just started at the start of this year um, and I think this will become more prominent as we start to come out of the COVID situation for obvious reasons. Now some of the things it can be used for listed up here um, so you know market research uh, IP advice. I mean, you can't use it, for example, to register for IP, but if you need some advice around IP from a consultant, then you can use that. Obviously, getting your website translated, uh, even things like international social media ads, SEO, that type of thing. Trade shows. So going back to the, the, the discussion about TAP earlier, you wouldn't be able to use this if you're using TAP as well, because that's kind of like double funding, which uh, obviously can't happen. Um, but if there's a show you wanted to do where TAP isn't available, then this uh, this grant could be used for that. Independent market visits, you know, um, that there's, there needs to be an element of newness about this. And what I mean by that is you wouldn't be able to put an application to say, I want to go to the US to visit uh, my long-standing relationship of agents and customers. That will probably get rejected. It's all about either looking at a new market um, or um, if you've got a new product or a kind of like a new niche within that market you're, you're already in. So there definitely needs to be an element of newness in there, if, if that makes sense. So please bear that in mind. Um, so yeah, if you wanted to go to the US because you know, you know, you know maybe you've you've made use of the ICE system that I talked about earlier, um, and you've had some potential uh, partners lined up, and then you can follow it with a visit. You know, this would be the perfect way to do that. You can also use it for consultancy uh, and commercial services. Um, um, so there's a few things there to say what it can be used for. Um, eligibility criteria talk to your ITA there's the they're saying that there's companies need to have a turnover of 500k or more to, to access this I don't think that is set in stone from what I've heard I think if you're below that um, you could still put in an application but obviously you would have to be able to demonstrate um, the, the ability for you to grow uh, you know you could be quite a new company you could even be a startup but, you know, if, if, if what you do and your product or your service has definitely got an international opportunity, then it will be looked at. But the 500K is kind of the benchmark that they do look at. You need to be an SME, so you, you can't be part of a, of a large company. Um, and, but, and the other thing I would mention as well is generally with these European grants in the past, retail has been excluded. Uh, it's just one of the things that these European grants that don't seem to like retail. Um, but for this one, and again, I would I, I would stress that you talk to your ITA, uh, what we're led to believe that B2C can be included, which is great news. You know, if you're looking to, I'm sure there's a lot of retailers on this call. So if you're looking to, to sell stuff via e-commerce overseas, uh, then you should be able to access this. So uh, that's, that's a big change, isn't it? Because like before b2b was the limitation on the erdf so yeah i'm yeah, a all... retailer and i want to try and help, help get my website translated and that's and i've never done it before there's a there's a strong chance i'll be able to access that, that money on a match fund basis yeah de right. definitely yeah i mean I, I would stress again have that discussion because we've had these grants in the past this is very new and and uh, it, it's 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 like a big machine so um you know i I hesitate saying 100% on that, but from what I'm led to believe, then then, then yes, uh, there's, if there's an element of B2B, that will certainly make it easier. Uh, but this this should be available to, to B2C companies. Okay. Uh, and just, what, what, sorry, sorry, Stephen. Sorry, Pete, I was just going to say, because uh, Betty, um, uh, many of us will, will know from NAM is joining us. Thank you, Betty, for being with us. Um, uh, she's uh, asking about utilizing this new fund for the, the NAM share in, in January 2022. So I guess as long as that was a new thing that you hadn't been before, would that, would that be okay to attend that trade show, do you think, with this? Yeah, yeah my, my, my gut feeling on that would be, um, you know, if you've been to NAM every year for the past 10 years, they're going to say no. 
because you know why would they give you you know taxpayers money to to do something that you're going to do anyway uh, so if it's new to you if you've not been before then that should be relatively straightforward if you've been if you've been once but maybe you've got a new product that you want to to, to, to promote this time then that should be okay as well so always my, my advice with this and your ICA can, can help you with this is, is that when you do the application and the application you would do online you do it on gov.uk a bit like doing your tax return you fill in your company details you then put in the activity that you want to do um, and, and you kind of have to demonstrate um, kind of what the new opportunity is there okay. so um, so yes, it can't it can't be something that's just simply a repeat, and you you can't say we have to go every year to keep up appearances, and you know, which obviously is very important. Don't get me wrong, but that would probably get rejected. Understood. So I think I think a couple of things. Then this you know retailers be you know this is something that's very interesting to look at from a retail perspective who've previously been excluded from these type of grants on a B two C basis. Um, obviously, tap grants haven't been written off yet. They're just under review. So we don't know if tap grants might not be still around. Uh, we, we're not sure yet. But as soon as we do have definitive view on that through our relationship with uh, DIT and the UK Export Partners Hub, then we'll certainly let you know. Um, but, you know, we, all we know is it's under review. It's not definitely ceased um, per se. Great. Pete, was there anything else you wanted to add at this point before we go and speak to Jane? Just very, very quickly. I mean, tap grants are great. They're relatively simple. Uh, with this, the grant I've just mentioned, um, you definitely have to go through an ITA. It isn't a quick process. Um, you know, you would have to be prepared to, to work with your ITA to develop an action plan. Um, it takes a bit of time. Forms, claim forms, if, if you've not done them before, just be prepared for that. Uh, but there's, you know, there's up to 9K available. So, uh, is certainly worth looking at. So I think that is, uh, I've gone over my scheduled time, apologies, but uh, yeah, that is it for me. So I will try and stop sharing my screen if I can. Well, and, and just on that point, I guess from an MIA perspective, you know, we've got, we've got over 200, uh, nearly 250 members, um, all of whom, uh, many of whom will be eligible for that grant. So as many of you as you can, please get in touch with your ITA or reach out to DIT as Pete suggested. And let's see if we can get some of that money to come into the, the music industry, because uh, we, we all know we need it desperately. So, Pete, thanks very much and appreciate you answering those questions as we go along. I think Alice is going to um, um, start sharing Jane's slides. And um, are you there, Jane? Is it? There? I am, yes. Can you hear me OK? We can hear you great. Fantastic. OK, excellent. OK. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much, Stephen, for inviting me to come along this afternoon and share with you a little bit about how UK export finance can support exporting companies. So if you could just move on, please, Alice. So UK export finance is part of the Department for International Trade. Um, but we are the government's export credit agency. So we also have a responsibility to Treasury, which is where we are sited down in London in the Treasury Building, um, because we are using taxpayers' funds to effectively underwrite and generate exporting activity, because clearly that's really important to the recovery of UK PLC. So our mission is that no viable export should fail for want of either finance or insurance. So yeah, if we could move on. To the next slide that's it so our products really fall into three principal categories now the financing element isn't an area that i will particularly cover off today um, it would warrant a presentation in its own right to be honest and that's really more focused at the provision of large capital or semi-capital equipment so if you are involved in that if you do produce large goods um that that would have a long life value or if you're involved in producing machinery that contributes to that then please get in touch with me because we can have that separate conversation the area that i really want to focus on today however is around how we can use government guarantees to help you raise working capital for your exporting activities and also importantly um, how to make sure you get paid and manage that credit risk that you have by operating mm -hmm. overseas 
So first of all, focusing on the guarantee. Um, our traditional product, which now has been implemented over around eight or nine years, was really developed following the financial crash of 2007, 2008, when it became apparent that government really needed to do something to um, help the banks in their appetite in lending to SME and supply chain companies. So what this relates to, and we work very much in partnership with the, the principal banks, although we are continually looking to onboard um, challenger banks and smaller banks all the time. So our portfolio of partner banks is increasing. But essentially the way it operates is that we will require a willing bank to provide a facility to your company when we can provide a government guarantee for up to 80% of the value of that facility to act as security. So what this really does is it really stretches the bank's appetite and helps maximize what they are able to do in providing credit or loans to you. Now, the great thing for you as an exporter is that service is completely free of charge. Because we're actually sharing the risk with the bank, we share the fees with the bank also. Now, with under this sort of like general description of um, government guarantees of security, that there come a number of things. So um, if you have an export contract, for example, um, the facility can be linked to that and we can guarantee that or a series of contracts. But also importantly, if you are required to provide any sort of contractual bonds, for example, if you receive a large deposit from your customer and they want a guarantee in return to say that, if you fail to fulfill the contract or anything should happen to your company in the interim, then they can claim on that bank guarantee and get their deposit back. Well, banks are really happy to do this kind of business, but because they see it as a real, a, a real liability, it's not a contingent liability for them, they often like to take that cash as collateral. So again, what we will do is we will look to provide a government guarantee so that they are able to release that cash back to you to enable you to start paying your suppliers and start fulfilling that contract. So it's a really important element there. Now, we have had a change in the way that we operate, which is what I really wanted to talk about today. So um, I'll come on to that shortly. But just to mention as well, um, the credit risk insurance. Um, and again, I'll expand on this, but this is where traditional credit risk insurance policy, which protects you against non-payment by your buyer and also against political risks. But if we can move on, what I really want to talk to you is the launch of our general export facility. Now, this is a recent enhancement to our working capital facility. And the idea is it's to really try and make it fully accessible to as many companies as we can, to make it a lot more easy for, for companies and banks to apply to us and really to give you more security and knowledge that you have something that's pre-arranged and will enable you to go out um, and market, try and secure new contracts, safe in the knowledge that you have finance in the background. So the reason or the way that this differs to our traditional facility is whereas historically it's always been looking at the particular export contract, this is very much looking at the exporting company itself. So it's for funds available for up to 25 million. If you need more than that, then we have another facility which is similar that would kick in. But really just looking at the SME level, we feel that this is perhaps adequate. And again, we will provide a guarantee for up to 80% of the facility to your bank. So it's still sharing that risk with a willing participating bank. So we need to have a bank in there who's willing to take that 20% risk. But the key thing for us is that it is not contract specific. So this really opens up the doors for companies that perhaps work on purchase orders or for perhaps companies that need to provide stock in trade to a distribution chain that they may have globally. Um, it's for if you perhaps need to raise finance for tooling, any kind of equipment, or if you indeed are um, a retailer and you have online sales, and perhaps if you're selling to consumers, direct to consumers, it's taken away the business to business element that we used to require under having an export contract. Now to be eligible for this particular facility, we need to satisfy ourselves, you need to meet our definition of an exporter, which is actually quite generous. So you need to have achieved either 20% of export sales in one of previous three years, 
or if that benchmark isn't achieved, then it's 5% on each of the previous three years. So that is actually fairly low. And as long as you can make that declaration to us that you meet that criteria and your bank is willing to work with us, then the bank can provide you with a, a facility that can be used for whatever purpose the bank may see fit. We will simply provide a guarantee to the bank. So, Jane, so, I just, can I just maybe, uh, from a music industry perspective, so yeah. take our business, for example, you know, we're, we're, we're manufacturing in, um, in the UK and China, we're exporting containers and orders all over the world. We're, we're going through a, our annual facilities renewal with our bank right now, yeah. you know, in, in the normal way. So are you saying that I don't need to have guaranteed contract now or purchase order? I, this is a this is a long term facility that will that will that will be what given to the bank to the company. How does that bit work? So the bank will provide a facility, a loan, a medium term loan, um, or a trade finance arrangement to the company itself. And in order to maximise the credit limit that the bank can provide, we will provide a government guarantee to the bank but it can be used across a whole range of different purposes now. So if you are a manufacturer, for example, um, and you have to import components, it can be used for supplier, lo supplier loans. Even if you're not a manufacturer, you just purchase the finished goods. If you import those finished goods, it can pay your suppliers for that, or it can, the facility can be used to pay your suppliers for that. Okay. Um, an important part as well is those goods don't even need to touch UK shores. So if you're having your goods, say, manufactured in China and you're exporting them directly to Europe, States, and or even if they're staying in China, um, then that facility can be used for that as well, long as we have a UK-based company. So that's, that's the that's important a, thing. That's a great point because that's actually, Ian asked that very question, do the goods have to have been manufactured in the UK? So yeah. as long as it's a British business and meets the criteria for export, um, yeah. The fact that we, like in my own case, my company make, makes in chi China as well as the UK, so we'd be able to access that facility. Um, and also, and another question that's come in is, um, does, is this applicable to B2C startups? So would funding be possible for B2C startups? Okay, and to the general facility, then potentially no. The reason being, we need to see that you have a track record as an exporter. So we need to have had at least that 5% or 20%. However, our traditional facility will still be available. So it doesn't stop us being able to have the conversation and trying to help you, but this is where we revert to requiring an export contract to be in place that the bank will then arrange a facility around the specific contract. But again, like with Pete's presentation around the internationalisation fund, B2C and B2B are both uh, eligible here. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jane. Okay. okay. So, um, as I say, before there's, as before, there's no cost involved for you as an exporter because the bank will actually share part of the margin with us. Um, and so, again, the emphasis here is really our, our focus and our due diligence is all about the UK business, i.e. you just to make sure that you can actually fulfill those contracts and keep your customers happy. Whereas in our traditional facility, we do do an element of due diligence on your buyer as well. Okay, if we could just move on, um, we have a really great example of a music related businesses that we've recently helped. Now this was under our um, traditional contract, it's not under the new Jeff scheme, um, but this, was, this is for a Surrey based company called Starkle um, and they their specialism was providing um, in-house music for um, their various different hospitality venues. Now they were successful in securing a really large contract for them, a four and a half million pound contract to supply over, well, around 1500 stores in the US. But their specialism was that um, the consumers themselves, as they're walking around the shopping mall, around the stores themselves, they can control what music they hear in that zone through an interactive app that they have um, available. So it's, it's quite a new um, philosophy when they started. Um, they, the company banked with Santander, um, and although Santander were really willing to support their customer and wanted to work with them, the size of this contract was far larger than what the, they had historically seen. 
So the bank approached us and worked together with us and we were able to provide the maximum guarantee for their £660,000 loan, which meant that they could start on their contract, they could start um, delivering and rolling out their programme and meeting all the conditions that their customer had laid down to them. And the great thing about this for this particular company is it really started to underpin their transition on the international um, stage. So they've gone from strength to strength, they've, they've recruited more people and they're starting to increase their sales around the US. Um, and as you may be able to see on the slides there that the chief exec just emphasized that without the cooperation between the bank and UK export finance, they simply wouldn't have been able to get this contract off the ground. So um, that's just a really nice success story that we have and we'd like to get a few more. Um, but if you could just move on to the other area that I just wanted to mention to you because it is very important in the current environment is around our credit risk insurance policy, which has been stable. It's always been there in the background and can be used either in conjunction with a finance arrangement that you have or on a standalone basis. So this could be really useful, for example, if you are starting to sell your goods through um, a distributor or, or trying to increase your network of distributors. Um, depending on the arrangement that you have, you may find that you have a credit risk exposure um, people are trying to negotiate longer credit terms. Um, and indeed all these things, particularly if you're selling to far flung corners of the world, will increase your trade cycle in and increase your credit risk. Now, as long as the private insurance market is unable to provide cover, which under current circumstances, they are retracting from a lot of areas, that is where the government is able to come in and to provide um, a stand or to provide a, a single contract cover for that. We're not looking to do whole of turnover um, insurance as a private market does. We are very much about carving out those contracts where the private sector has no appetite. So we will be able to provide you with non protection against non-payment by your buyer. But very importantly, if you're selling to perhaps difficult markets, then it will provide you against any political or sovereign risk that may arise there. So for example, if something should happen, um, such as civil unrest or a trade embargo, um, or indeed war should break out, something that happens that prevents your customer being able to make payment to you, even if they wanted to, then our credit risk insurance policy would help provide protection against that. So we go up to 95% of the contract value. And if you are raising finance for any of your contracts, this is the kind of thing that can really help bolster your bank or your financier's appetite as well. So again, it's just worth being aware that that is available have a conversation with us. Um, we can give you an indication of what the likely costs can be. If you're aware of that at the outset, then it may even be possible to recover some of those costs when you're pricing the contract, um, because there is a premium to be paid for that. But it's not as expensive as some people may think. Um, we're not an insurance company. We're not here to sort of try and make money out of uh, those single policies. We are here to really facilitate that trade. And just, just on that point, Jane, we've, uh, we've had a question from uh, Brendan Murray from uh, the Trust Network. Hi, Brendan. Thanks for being with us. Um, he was asking about that export insurance policy. Does that cover services as well as products? It does, yes. Anything that can be put within a contract, then yes, absolutely, it can be. I suppose the, the aspect to consider about services is sometimes if you have capacity to turn off a service, that is a great incentive to get payment as well, though. But um, so you know, obviously, you don't want to disrupt relationships by by doing that, and you don't want to be in breach of your contracts. But um, yeah, just look at all remedies available. Thank you. Okay, so if we can just move on to um, my last slide now. I just wanted to emphasise that we the, the breadth of countries that we can provide support for. Take a look at our website. There is a country database on there that gives you an indication of what our appetite might be. Um, just wanted to throw out as well that although there's a perception that UK export finance and government is really here to support the large contracts, um, it's not it's that's that size of the business is still there but during our last financial year actually 79 percent of the companies that we supported fell within the sme category 
So we are very much here and committed to supporting businesses on the trade finance spectrum, um, looking at raising capital, working capital and making sure you get paid. So it is free, impartial government advice. I am actually one of 24 export finance managers based around the UK. Um, so whereas with DIT and, and the international trade advisors, they may be slightly different in, in each region. What you should hear from one export finance manager should be the same as what you hear elsewhere. So it doesn't really matter if you want to take my contact details, we can have a conversation afterwards. Or alternatively, um, our website gives a list of who all the regional EFMs are. Um, and what I would encourage you to do is, is look up your local contact, connect with us on LinkedIn. We have a lot of things that are changing at the moment and new developments that are, are coming out. So just keep an eye on our website, keep an eye on our communications and our LinkedIn posts and just to see what we can do. Um, and hopefully at some point we may be able to help you on your exporting journey. That's great, Jane. And thanks so, so much. And perfect timing. We're, we're bang on five o'clock. So that's worked okay. brilliantly. Um, we've had one question, Dan, um, from Applied House, which we've come through, but I'll, I'll reply to that via email, Dan. Uh, so you'll get a response from me on that. Um, and I hope that's been helpful. We've had a lot of positive comments, uh, thanks and appreciation coming through to both uh, Pete and, and Jane. Um, I think I think my, my summary would be um, on the internationalization fund, there's a real opportunity for, um, uh, for MI uh, companies to apply, speak to your ITA. If you don't have an ITA, go get one um, as soon as you can. And we'll definitely be sharing all the slides and, and Jane's contact details and Pete's contact details. And on the UK export finance, um, the new Jeff, I think it's it politely called, is that right, Jeff? It is, yes. Yeah. We've so, christened um, Jeff, yes. Yeah, it's great to hear that that's, you know, re really targeted for SMEs because, um, you know, two thirds of uh, MIA members are small and medium enterprises. So that, that general facility that will sit alongside the, the bank facilities is gonna be very, very beneficial, I'm sure. Um, and Stephen Wicks is saying thank you as well. Thanks, Stephen, for being with us. Um, I would like to extend my warm appreciation to, to Pete uh, and to Jane. Thanks very much for joining us, everyone. Uh, Alice will be sending out all the slides, so you'll have all that information and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.